a really special episode today. Today is Tom McDowell from Toronto has some some pretty interesting research. Great to have you here today, Tom. And hi, Anna. Nice to have you again. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it would be great if you could like introduce yourself to our audience, Tom. Yeah, so my name is uh, Tom McDowell. I am a an instructor at the Department of uh, Public and uh, Politics and Public Administration at Toronto Metropolitan University in Canada, uh, and my research largely focuses on the intersection between social inequality and critical theory. Uh, I was one of the lead researchers on the, uh, the, the the study of the Ontario Basic Income Pilot, a uh, series of academics. Uh, the scholarly community came together to author a series of reports and academic studies, and I've been one of the, the lead authors on uh, several of those studies. So I'm really just here today to kind of talk about the Ontario Basic Income Pilot, uh, some of uh, the, the, the impacts that we have found from our research, uh, and perhaps to talk about basic income more broadly. Uh, so like... What got you like interested into basic income and inequality into research? What got you interested in all of that? Well, I, I, my initial interest in basic income probably started back uh, around 2015, 2016. Uh, it, you know, it was uh, an innovative uh, policy solution that began to receive a lot more uh, mainstream attention. And so that sort of piqued my interest. And then we had uh, the provincial government here in Ontario, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later if you're interested, uh, but the, the provincial government here in Ontario started or announced in in 2016 that it was going to uh, have a basic income pilot right here in the province of Ontario. Uh, the details at first were uh, not, uh, you know, were, were, uh, you know, there, there weren't a lot of details at, at the outset of the, of the process, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was clear that there was going to be some kind of major uh, process or project uh, experimentation here in Ontario. Uh, now, I lived in Hamilton at the time, which was one which turned out to be one of the sites where the basic income pilot was being conducted. And so that piqued my interest even more. It was like, oh, wait a minute, this is quite interesting. This is actually happening here in the city. I, I knew people who were applying. I didn't apply myself, but I probably would have been eligible as a PhD student, a recent, a recent graduate. Uh, so I was just generally interested, and I thought there might be the possibility to eventually do some degree of research with some of the participants in town. Now, of course, at the time, there was already Already an evaluative team that was uh, put together by the province to conduct the evaluation of the basic income pilot. Of course, as we'll talk about with the cancellation of the Ontario basic income pilot, that evaluation team and all of the evidence was disbanded. And so what happened in 2018 is that, um, and again, I can talk more about the political context here in a moment if you're interested, but the provincial, conser a new conservative government was elected into power and canceled the basic income pilot. And probably most people have heard about this element of the cancellation. But what perhaps a lot of people don't recognize is that the disbanding of the evaluation team meant that there was, there was no data from the pilot whatsoever. So a number of people had been receiving basic income for, in many cases, a year and a half, 18 months, 20 months, uh, and, and had uh, the scholarly community not... Uh, stepped in to fill the void, that evidence simply would have been lost to the mists of time. And so uh, we felt impelled as uh, researchers living in Hamilton. Uh, I was involved with other things, but you know, really I didn't have a major project uh, on the go. And I thought that perhaps I would have the time. Of course, we had to do it largely on a volunteer basis. There was no money for any of this. Um, so, you know, but but a, a research colleague of mine and I thought that we might have the time and the energy to put forward um, to, to address this very important project and to make sure that this information wasn't lost. And so that really was sort of, I mean, this was my area of interest anyways, but sort of focusing on basic income as a policy solution uh, was something that, that um, probably happened largely as a, as a consequence of happenstance, just where I happened to be, uh, the right place at the right time. But as you'll hear, as we go on with our discussion today, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a clear convert to basic income at this point, uh, because the, the, the uh, results that we found were, were significant and profound and transformative. So perhaps I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's a little bit of an introduction to my interest in, in basic income, but, uh, um, you know, anyways, so, so perhaps I'll leave it there for now. Could you talk more about the political context that you're you're seeing? And I yeah, absolutely. So the the basic income pilot was announced in 
2016, the budget speech in 2016, was, there was, as I say at the time, um, a little meat on the bones, so to speak, in terms of exactly what the pilot was going to look like. And so that process occurred over the over the course of the next year or or so. Uh, Hugh Siegel, who was a, a former senator and a longtime advocate, a conservative senator, um, and a longtime advocate, a, what we would call here in Canada a red Tory, so that is someone who is essentially uh, on the right but has uh, more sort of left-leaning social democratic views as far as uh, social politics are concerned. Or, or as far as political economy might be concerned in terms of helping people, this sort of thing. So Hugh Siegel, who was a, a, a conservative, a long-standing conservative uh, senator, authored the report. And he put together a methodology that the province essentially um, took as its blueprint in this report. And what was so interesting about the report is that, and again, I can get into a little bit more of this, but it was designed as a poverty reduction program rather than as um, uh, a geared to employment basic income program. And I think that's one of the really interesting aspects about uh, OBIP, the Ontario Basic Income Pilot, is that it was it was geared towards a, um, a poverty reduction as a welfare program rather than simply an employment program. Um, so the, the pilot was uh, rolled out in early 2017 in Ontario. And actually, the government had a difficult time getting people to apply for it at first, which is one of the more interesting elements of the story. Uh, I think this speaks to distrust in government. Uh, I think a lot of people that, that we spoke to felt like it was too good to be true. There must be a catch associated with something like this. They wouldn't just give us free money like this. But of course, that was indeed the case. And uh, I think some of that also had to do with, with public relations. They hadn't done a very good job of explaining what the pilot was or uh, why people should sign up. Uh, so th they did some of that in 2017. They had uh, a number of sort of public campaigns trying to get people to sign up, and eventually they did. They did, um, you know, get uh, an adequate number of applicants. So fast forward to 2018. This liberal government that's in power, which is largely a social democratic government uh, or social democratic leaning government, depending on who you ask, uh, but certainly some of their policies were oriented in that direction. They had uh, they were developing a thing and the basic they were developing a, a policy uh, platform uh, that was called the Roadmap uh, to Ending Poverty in Ontario, or the Roadmap to End Poverty in Ontario, I believe it was called. And basic income was meant to be an element of that. Now, in 2018, there is a provincial election here in Ontario, and the Liberals, the, that social democratic leaning party that was in power and then initiated the basic income pilot, was swept out of power. Uh, they wound up uh, just with a rump of seats in the legislature and were reduced to third party status. Uh, they don't even have um, essentially a recognized party status in the legislature anymore. So they had very little influence, and now a conservative government came into power. And the conservative government, despite promising during the campaign that they would maintain the basic income pilot, almost immediately can moved to cancel it. And so there was a, uh, uh, um, uh, I can't remember exactly the euphemism they, they used, but it was something effective, a, a rollback period, uh, where the pilot was essentially going to be uh, 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 disbanded. And so people received basic income for, I think, another eight or nine months, at which point the Ontario basic income pilot was ended. People lost their supports. And um, and all of the, the the research team, as I say, was disbanded. And all of the information, essentially, with the exception of this uh, baseline survey that was conducted that gave very almost no information about basic income except for some demographic information, was completely lost. And so that was where we tried to step in to fill the void. And I can talk a little bit more about what that, that project looked like in a minute. So that is the political context here in Ontario. Uh, a conservative government came into power uh, and has largely ended the process. And, and, and now the energy, at least here in Ontario, has turned towards advocacy, trying to advocate um, based upon some of the evidence that we've acquired, but also just a uh, you know, general uh, riding the wave of momentum that's happening around the world towards basic income. Why did they cancel it? Like, why did they cancel it despite that it was actually like advocated for it by a conservative and despite that they promised that they would keep it yeah I think I think the reasons were primarily ideological I mean I don't think that's a controversial thing to say the, the government uh made it clear I mean the, I think the government's continual refrain after canceling the pilot was that uh uh the best social program is a job to give you a sense as to the the, the sort of laissez-faire attitude of the government and the way in which they were sort of assessing 
the uh, the outcomes of the basic income pilot. But let's be frank: had had they seen the results and publicized the results of the Ontario of the of the Ontario basic income pilot based on what we've seen, they would have found that it had a profound and transformative impact on people, and there would have been all kinds of political pressure for them to implement a basic income. And so um, it seems to me that from a political perspective, the government simply didn't want that evidence. Uh, to be released to the public. And they didn't want that type of pressure because ideologically, they're simply not aligned with the idea of a basic income. How was the impact on the society of the cancel of the project? The cancellation was devastating for uh, for recipients. Um, we uh, One of the findings from, from our study is that something like 97%, so almost everyone, had to cancel some type of long-term plan associated with with uh, the cancellation. So you have to remember that almost every, in fact, there was a lawsuit. Uh, I, I think it's been largely unsuccessful, but there was a lawsuit filed against the government uh, by a former basic income recipient saying, hold on a minute, you promised us this money for three years. In fact, you're violating research ethics <laughs> by simply pulling away uh, you know, everyone's income during this period. And, and, and one of the things that we can get into here is that one of the profound benefits of basic income is that it enabled people to plan in a, in a long-term way, right? To make long-term plans because they, they had a reliable source of, of income, a long-term source of income. And of course, the, the pilot completely uh, upended uh, the sense of security that people had. Uh, but not only that, we've also found that it uh, had, um, as you might expect, a very significant impact on people's perceptions of government and trust in government, right? Uh, this is already a population that uh, does not necessarily have uh, positive views of the role of government, largely because they've dealt with uh, punitive social assistance programs and these sorts of things. Uh, and this largely emboldened that sense. There was a lot of anger and a lot of frustration because for many people, this was their lifeline and it was being pulled away. So, um, yeah, it was it was devastating from a social perspective for many of the of the recipients, and it's one of the really sad tales of of the Ontario basic income pile. Um, you do like the Conservatives still rule? Like I guess like it has been like four years ago since they won the next, uh, last election. So yeah, and and there was another election in in twenty twenty two, and they won another majority government. So they'll be in power right through till I think twenty twenty six at the at the very least. Uh, now there are, and and I don't. Um, I don't want to pretend as though I know a lot about these, uh, or, or certainly about the the other process that's going on. But Prince Edward Island here in in Canada uh, is reviewing the potential of a basic income. It's a very small province, with uh, you know I think maybe just over a hundred thousand, you know, a couple hundred thousand people, and so they could. Uh, it's, it, it would be a small scale type model kind of place where a basic income could really work very effectively. So they're thinking about it, but I'm not sure how far or how serious, frankly, they are about the process. It's it's very difficult to tell sometimes. Uh, you know, some scholars in the basic income tradition have talked, I think De, De Westblier has talked about uh, cheap political support for, uh, this is particularly a problem, I believe, in, in Europe, where political parties say, oh, yes, basic income, it sounds like a great idea. Of course, it's a great idea electorally, but really we have to start getting down to the point where we're actually putting in the architecture, the infrastructural the policy architecture to actually implement these programs. And maybe we can talk about that later in the conversation as well. I was thinking about the research path that you, that you guys make to start the pilot project. So how was that? Yeah, good question. So um, essentially what we did now, we, we had the extreme difficulty uh, with this process of having to figure out a way uh, to find recipients without knowing who they were. <laughs> because not only did the government get rid of all of the, the any evidence that it, had, that it had collected, which wasn't very much at, at that time, uh, but it also it refused to uh, publish the, the, the list of anyone who had been on the pilot or to provide them to anyone. So uh, as far as we were aware, there was no, uh, we didn't have any access to any of that information. So we our study and in that respect, and this is one of the limitations of our study, uh, it had to be self-selected. So that is to say, we had to go out into the community and try to recruit people through Facebook, through uh, editorials in the newspaper, these kinds of things, to try to recruit people who were formerly basic income recipients. This is harder than it sounds because we were we were focusing specifically on the Hamilton region. And now the Hamilton is um, a city of about 750,000 people in Ontario. It was the largest site, but there were only a thousand people 
out of that 750,000, approximately a million people who received basic income. So we had to find those people and then get them to participate in our study. Um, we had two uh, essentially approaches. We had uh, a survey with 217 questions. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> not 217 questions. That would be too long. It was about, it was about 65 questions. Uh, but we got about 217 uh, participants mm -hmm. to to participate in in the actually like former basic so about 20 percent of what we think the the actual number was uh participated in the survey so it was a fairly uh, significant uh representation so uh and, and, we, and from that we received a number of really interesting findings uh you know we focused on things like mental health general health physical health food and nutrition, family and social relationships, transportation, and of course the impact of the cancellation. So these kinds of things. And then we tried to use those as uh, a benchmark to, to focus on uh, in, 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 a, in a later interview process, the types of questions that we ought to ask. And so we did a series of about 48 longer form interviews where we paid recipients $100 each. Um, to discuss in more detail their experiences on the pilot. And really the way that we tried to do that was just a sort of before and after comparison. Uh, how was your experience on basic income relative to your life before? And again, we can talk about some of the the, um, the findings from that. So essentially we have a quantitative foundation. We had a, uh, a survey and then we had the qualitative stories where we were able to get into uh, some of the substance of what these improvements look like. So uh, before like getting into the results and like the impact that you found out to be true, um, can you tell us like who were the people who received the basic income? Was it completely random? Was there like were it certain people? Um, and like what is this, what was the situation in Ontario? Was there like a lot of poverty or is it a wealthy? Uh, Look. Yeah, great question. So, uh, yeah, so the the the, the, the poverty rate in Ontario is about nine to twelve percent. Uh, a little bit higher in Hamilton, I think. It's sort of uh, I wouldn't call it rural, sort of a suburban working class community. Um, uh, that, that's the situation. Hamilton, the, the employment rate, like I say, in the province was about nine to twelve percent. What was your first question again? I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't write it down. The... Uh, no problem. Um, the first question was like they choose who would participate was it by chance or no it was uh it was specifically for low income recipients i don't actually have the the specific numbers in front of me i think it was uh you know something to the effect of for an ind a single individual it was less than $34,000 you had to be receiving less than $34,000 for a couple or for a family it was something of less than $50,000 so relative to what we call here the low income measure in canada it was people who were living below the low income measure uh, so it was only it was it was a means tested program so it wasn't a universal basic income uh, pilot mm -hmm. it was only for low income recipients but that included a fairly wide variety of people who were working and non working about 45% of the people we surveyed uh, the former participants we surveyed uh were uh, uh either disability insurance or welfare insurance recipients prior to receiving the pilot, but 55% weren't. And, and we're, uh, you know, approximately that number uh, were previously employed before receiving basic income. So it was a fairly, uh, it was, it was, it was designed for low income recipients, but it was a fairly broad uh, selection uh, for, from that demographic. So the project starts just to a certain group. And how do you research or I don't know research to expand to the universal to universal context where yeah, everyone I, mean, I don't know, I mean, we, know we, were, we were only trying to explore uh, we we just wanted to explore the findings for what they were right so we can't really speak to what the universal impacts would be because we only focused on the the specific element of uh, of the uh, recipients here in here and on. In, in Hamilton. Uh, so we, we, I can't really speak to what the impacts of a universal basic income would be because we, you know, we just didn't, we didn't explore that. Now, I will say this, uh, one of the elements of uh, the basic income pilot here in Ontario is that it did have a saturation site. And for those people who have studied the, um, uh, the income 
study from the from the 1970s, they'll know that Dauphin, Manitoba was a saturation site. And so the Ontario pilot actually tried to replicate that with a saturation site in Lindsay, Ontario, which is a town of, uh, I should know this, I think it's about 35,000 people. It's, it's, it's a reasonably small community. And the idea there, although it wasn't a universal income, basic income, right, it was still a means test of basic income. But the idea there, and again, this is something that's we simply don't have any data on this because this was this is something that had the basic income pilot been completed to to its full fruition, we would have that data probably around now. We'd know some of this information. But the idea there was to look at the community, some of the community level impacts. So did it impact incarceration rates? Did it impact graduation rates from high school or university or college? Did it uh, did are there any broad impacts that 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 one could view that you wouldn't be able to see in a Giving, a, giving extra money to a thousand people in a city of like Hamilton of 750,000 people, it's going to be a pebble in the ocean. But in a smaller community like this, the idea was that there might be a more substantial community level benefit. But again, we simply don't know because the uh, that research was never conducted. I, I noticed there was a pattern, wasn't uh, uh, also basic income is a very famous basic income project in Manitoba during the like, 1970s or so. Also, yeah. like implemented by a regional government, then they lost the election, then abandoned. The That's true. Is that like a Canadian pattern or like? We have a terrible history in this country of of uh, electing conservative governments that then that then uh, cancel basic income pilots. Yes, in fact, you know, I mean, since since you know we've brought it up, we might as well get into it now. One, so the premier. The former premier who actually uh, wrote the forward to our most recent report, the former premier, the social democratic premier, Kathleen Wynne, who implemented the basic income uh, pilot in the first place. Uh, she claims that her inspiration for the basic income pilot was reading uh, a report. She didn't say which one, um, but from the original income study. And she remembered feeling a f uh, disappointment that the, the whole process had just been ended. And she thought we should try that here in Ontario. And now the thing that she says is that it actually took her quite a bit of time to get her caucus on board. That is to say, uh, her the political party that she led. Uh, she had a hard time getting her government, her full government, on board for the idea of a basic income, despite floating it. You know, I don't want to say the exact year, but probably as early as 2014, 2015, she took office in 2013. Now, she wasn't able to convince cabinet early on to do this. Eventually, she was able to do so. And she said that one of her main regrets is that one of her main regrets as premier, not just simply, uh, you know, about this issue, is that she was did not start the program earlier. She did not start the program earlier in such a way that we could have gotten to the point where we at least got uh, the findings from, from the study. And that was something that uh, obviously weren't able to do. So that is one of the lessons here, uh, the Premier says, start these these projects as early as you can in your mandate because political winds change and they can shift and that can have a profound impact on these pilots. Uh, we live in a divisive ideological environment and uh, again, you know, uh, political change can occur very, very rapidly. So. so do you think that if the projects was more solid, it, it wouldn't be changed by the political changes because you were talking about the conservative well, uh, government that you have right now and that was tough to continue the project, they canceled. So do you think that if the project just goes longer, then it would be solid enough so anyone, no one would cancel it? Well, I don't. I think that I think that I think that this government would have canceled. Um, I would have canceled the basic income pilot regardless of of the you know there there are some issues uh that one could one could pick out with this methodological structure as with any uh pilot like this but i don't think it would have mattered how strong the methodology of this pilot was the government just simply did not have an interest in seeing this information uh disseminated publicly because it would have been this pressure on the government from communities all around Ontario, all around the world We've seen this information and said look at how if Effect of a basic income this. We have, you know, more than 10% of people in this province, uh, you know, are living in severe poverty. 
uh, why, why don't we fix this problem? So I, th I really think that's the reason why this government, uh, you know, this is only one area of this government's sort of ideological approach. They're, they're also moving towards the privatization of healthcare. Uh, you know, Canada is known for its public health care system, and we are seeing it privatized. Uh, the architecture, the legislative architecture is being put in place for that right now by this government. So it's a fairly right wing neoliberal government uh, that did not have interest in developing social programs. So uh, I just simply don't think it would have mattered how how strong methodologically the the uh, the pilot's design had been. This wasn't a question of the design. It was a question of politics. So like, why did people choose that government why? The people in Canada keep choosing those conservative. <laughs> that's, that's a broad question that might be better for for pundits. Um, you know, I, um, I'll, I'll put it to you this way: there was a very uh, aggressive uh, propaganda campaign led by uh, right wing interests and moneyed interests here in Ontario. Uh, that had a very profound effect on the Wynn government. Uh, it was a, it was a, it had been in power. The the Liberals, this party had been in power for I think 13, 15 years, 2003 to 18. So 15 years they'd been in power. Uh, they were long in the tooth. There was a sentiment for change here in Canada. There are there are largely three main parties. Or here in Ontario, there are three main parties: the NDP, which is sort of more left-leaning social democratic, the liberals, which are usually in the middle, but can go either way, and then the conservatives. And uh, it usually oscillates between the liberals and the conservatives. And so it was the conservatives uh, turn in office, as it were. And so it was really that simple. Now, as to why they won another majority government recently, an even more substantial majority than they won the first time, uh, despite canceling the basic income pilot, despite doing all these things, COVID, COVID had a major impact on that and changed the uh, changed both the trajectory of the government for a short period of time and the way that people perceive the premier. So there's a lot of sort of local issues involved with it that probably might not even be that interesting to your to your listenership. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a right wing government that uh, doesn't have much interest in in social democracy. Besides the people not believing their project, do you think there's another barrier to people to embrace basic income in Canada? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the one of the impacts of the of the cancellation of the pilot here in Ontario uh, has actually been to amplify the political energy associated with basic uh, associated with with basic income advocacy. Uh, I, I wouldn't actually say that there was. Uh, I mean, there was there's a basic income. Uh, we you know we have a, a basic income network here in Canada that does very good work and has been doing it for a long time. Uh, so it's not to say that there weren't people involved in it, but in terms of it being a mass movement, there really wasn't a lot of talk about basic income prior to the cancellation. It's kind of funny uh, that, that the cancellation actually created a lot of publicity around this issue, uh, not only in Canada but around the world. Um, it was condemned uh, not not just in Canada but again by people from 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 everywhere. Uh, it's cancellation. And uh, it, it was actually something that early in the Ford government, the conservative government's mandate, was something that people could galvanize around. One of, it was one of the first actions that the Ford government took was to cancel this pilot. And so for people who were already upset with the government, it actually gave them, uh, you know, just because of their ideological inclinations, it, it, it gave them something concrete to organize around. Um, so I actually think that the cancellation has, has led to more energy, especially here in Ontario. We've got a basic income youth network here now. Uh, there's constantly articles about basic income in the newspaper. Uh, it's being discussed in the Senate right now. There's a Senate bill um, here in Canada that at the, at the federal level that is uh, looking to implement a basic income. I should warn you, uh, your international listeners, that uh, Senate bills very rarely get passed here in Canada. So it's not likely something that is going to uh, result in a nationwide basic income here in Canada. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not important to have these kinds of discussions. They're having all kinds of committee hearings about basic income. It continues to sort of amplify um, uh, advocacy for the issue in, in the country. And I, and I, and I genuinely think that uh, given some of the, the problems associated with uh, the changing nature of, of the economy, uh, the, the weakening of our, uh, uh, the architecture of the welfare state or uh, welfare state institutions, that 
policymakers are going to have no choice but to move towards something like a basic income at some point. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think uh, the, the there's there's considerable political momentum for a basic income in Canada, uh, and I think it would be a popular policy choice if uh, a government were to implement one. So let's look at the meat at the bone uh, in the bone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, let's do it. Tell us, like, what were like the most interesting findings for you? Well, I think I think just generally, I would say the integral benefits. I mean, what I I really wasn't expecting. I, I mean, if you give people additional money, you might expect that there's going to be a benefit. I mean, that's that's a fairly intuitive thing. Um, but what I really didn't expect was how integral these benefits were going to be. And that is to say that it wasn't just one aspect of someone's life. It wasn't just, oh, well, I can step back and take some time off work, uh, you know, because I'm not being treated well in my job or it's not consistent with what I want to do. Uh, but it was that making one change like that in an individual's life, adding income security to someone's life could have uh, uh, a kaleidoscope of effects, of impacts for people. So, for example, uh, buying, having additional money allowed one individual we spoke to to purchase a new shirt and buy a new wardrobe for the first time in their lives. And that had a profound impact on the way that they were treated publicly, they said. They actually started to get treated with more respect. They felt as though they were more comfortable going out in the community, and that led to them feeling as though they could participate in the community more consistently than they did. They had a job interview that they were able to actually dress properly for and gave them a better chance probably of receiving that job. They were uh, more confident when they were in the community, et cetera, et cetera. So these, this is what I mean, that like just providing people who, uh, many of whom were not used to having enough money to survive and constantly scraping by, just having to do what was necessary to live and to put food on the table and, and, and shelter over their heads that were now able to actually focus on their lives in ways that they were never able to before. And it was transformative for some people. So that to me was the, the most uh, profound impact. It's sort of a general thing to say, I know. But really, it's not just one aspect. It Income security helps people in almost every aspect of their lives. Earlier, you talked about the mental health research that you did with the questionnaire, right? So could you talk more about that? Because you said that the results were vanished, but I think the mental health, health is an area that sometimes we don't talk enough of the results of basic income. Absolutely. It was one of the most significant aspects of, of our study. Uh, we, we did a, a number of questions uh, in, the, in the quantitative element on mental health and uh, profound mental health benefits. Uh, again, some of the things that I mentioned about people feeling uh, more confident, uh, people who felt less shame, going on in the community. So I'll give you another example, another instance, um, you know, sort of the integral benefits here associated with, with basic income. Uh, one, one person, one woman told us uh, that, you know, her entire life, she had never been able to afford to buy Christmas gifts for her grandchildren. And what basic income did was enable her for the first time to actually buy her grandchildren gifts. And that made her feel so much more a part of her family and, and part of the family dynamic. That, had a, that has a really critical impact on people's mental health because it makes them feel integrated and recognized within their communities. Um, another way in which mental health was impacted, people were able to eat more nutritious foods. We didn't have to go to the grocery store and just buy the cheapest thing that they could find or to the food bank. We had a number of people who were previously using food banks who no longer had to use food banks. Now they started buying, you know, they told us, oh my goodness, I was able to buy a dragon fruit for the first time in my life. I love dragon fruit. It turns out I was eating so healthy. I was eating smoothies every day. I was able to get the special kind of uh, organic foods that you know, agree with my stomach better. And I didn't have to, and that made me feel better. A number of people were able to get gym memberships and, and start exercising more often, as an example. People were able to uh, get more reliable transit so that they were able to get around uh, to other places more often. So you can imagine how this had um, 
you know, uh, an overlapping impact on their lives in many different ways. So most people were happier, healthier, more confident, felt less shame, uh, and had a better outlook on life than before they started the pie. To be honest, like really heartwarming the, the stuff that you <laughs> just said. Like, like for example, like um, that, that. What I love about that story of the grandmother is like you gave her, and she continued giving. Yeah, it's like exactly, and that's one of the things that we found as well. There was a there was a there was a significant a substantial increase in in community. Uh, participation. So, uh, you know, we, we noticed a, an increase in volunteer work, people who are able to, you know, especially people who are at points in their lives where they were, they felt able to give back to the community, perhaps they were, you know, they, they uh, weren't in a position where they felt they had the need to work or they were working and decided to do something else. People participating and volunteering in the community, giving them time to focus on the kinds of things that, that give them value. One person, for instance, actually used his basic income to run for city council. They actually entered politics. They would never have had time or or the ability to do that. This was an opportunity for them. They had a couple of local issues that were very important to them. They didn't win, but they were able to go out and advocate for those issues. I mean, that's 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 the kind of sort of uh, giving back that we're talking about that we found from the pilot. So there are community level impacts in that respect as well. At least that's what we found. I just think that here, or I don't know in social media sometimes we see people talking i don't know negative about basic income because they say that oh if you give free money people will spend with i don't know drugs i saw that here in my my country sometimes we have this public this i i forgot the word but these programs that also give familiar, money to think, poor people yeah yes That's yes it, both familiar <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And some politicians say that Bolsa Familia is, they should end it because people are making child just to receive more money and that doesn't make any sense. And I just see a lot of things that they comment about these programs that doesn't make sense. And how do you come with the results of the, the project and say, oh, that's not it. I actually help healthcare and mental health and education. How do you use the I'll actually go one step. Yeah, I'll actually go one step further and say I actually think basic income is an employment program. All right. Now why why would I say such a thing? Because it had overlapping benefits for people that enabled them to be more active participants in turn in the labor market. So for some people this did mean that they that they that they left a job in which they were being treated poorly. Uh, I think about 25% of the people who were previously working uh, did leave the labor market, at least for a period of time. But in not every case was this people simply leaving the market to leave the market. Uh, in fact, in almost no cases was that the case. In, in, in about half of those cases, people went back to school and started retraining. And because the they recognized this was their opportunity to go back and retrain in the in areas that were consistent with, 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 with what they wanted. They could leave a job in which they were being horribly treated. And in a lot of cases, we heard this number of cases in terms of treatment in the workplace, either from customers or from bosses, uh, you know, uh, labor, labor rights violations, these kinds of things, right? Uh, so people were able to pull back from these situations, take control of their lives and start doing things that were good for themselves. Now, even people who didn't and, and you know, we've talked about uh, how people were able to do things like purchase shirts. People were able to, one person told us, for example, uh, he was about to have to quit his job because he wasn't making enough and he couldn't afford his apartment anymore because the the uh, the rent had gone up or he just wasn't in a position where he was able to afford it anymore. Basic income enabled him to stay there and continue working in his job. A lot of people we, we spoke with didn't have cars. It is really difficult to get around uh, the, the, the greater Toronto area. It's uh, very suburban. It's very uh, it's car oriented culture. So having access to public transportation is critical for people to be able to get to work in the first place. So um, you know this this was the kind of thing. Almost every single person who received basic income. I can't say every single person, but just about every single person we spoke to was using basic income to improve their lives, or if you will, their human capital. Almost every single person. Now, some people left work 
for specific family-based reasons. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we had one person whose mother was sick with cancer and he took some time off. Now he didn't stop work, but he, 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 he reduced his hours so that he could look after his mother. This is the kind of thing that we need in our society, right? I mean, we don't have any care for these. We have very little care for these types of people. We rely on families and families are dealing with more than they can handle. And so basic income was a way for people to basically free themselves up in such a way. We had another woman who bought, can you imagine this? She had cancer and she bought burial insurance so her son wouldn't have to pay for her funeral. Not an employment-based thing, I know, but these are the kinds of stories where people were, were doing, people who are doing what they can to survive on a daily basis are able to enhance their lives in critical ways by feeling that they're able to take control of their circumstances. Yeah, then, actually, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to comment on that um, yes, because yes. I actually you had a conversation, I think, about that before. Um, your point, you said that that man who um, cared about his mother, like, on reduced for that his work. He, he actually, what he was doing was work. It's not just unpaid work. Like if you would have like hired a nurse to do that, would have said that I'm increased employment. Like. That's right. And of course we define employment only in terms of uh, quite often only in terms of paid forms of employment. And I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. There there are uh un unpaid forms of work, of course, right? The critical, necessary work. Uh, that is falling between the cracks in, in in societies that have been neoliberalized, where social safety nets have been 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 hollowed out. Uh, people can't get good home care, for instance, you know, or it's difficult to get. It can be expensive to get. This is the kind of thing that helps people in their everyday lives in critical critical ways. I I was thinking about something that I forgot, so I would just ask you to comment about the. Uh... How, what are you doing now? Because you talk about the cancel of the program. So oh, yeah. what I, I, next steps? I'm really happy to talk next about that step. actually, because we are we are actually, uh, we have done most of the research now, most of the interviews for a, sort of a, a follow-up aspect to the, to the, to the pilot, uh, to, to the original study. So the original study told us really important things about the benefits of basic income while people were receiving basic income. But the critical question is, uh, and there aren't, re there isn't really a lot of literature on this. Uh, how did people respond three years after, and and given a global pandemic, uh, to basic income? What were the long term impacts, in other words? And what we've found so far, I can't speak too much to it because I haven't really, you know, we're still analyzing the data. Uh, but but what it seems that we found is that there have been substantial, substantial long-term benefits for people. So people were able to, uh, the seeds that people planted while they had that extra money, even if it wasn't for as long as they expected, have have blossomed into, uh, in, in, in not every case, but in some cases have, have blossomed into the, the, the types of realities that they'd hoped for. Um, so that's that's been really good to see. And, you know, some people, for example, uh, you know, we, we have one, one, one fellow who started up a, an organization talking about volunteering in the community. He started up an organization where they clean up garbage in the community, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's become a, a large nonprofit now that is, that is quite successful and he's doing very well for himself. You know, so um, there are all kinds of stories like this. And so the, the next element of the study is sort of look at some of these long term stories and find out how basic income, even that short period, even if it was only 12 to 18 months, how did that period of income security change your life? So that's that's where we are now. We, within a year or so, well, we hope to have something about that. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, actually, I have two questions. Let's start. Uh, yeah. Let's start with yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I read that sentence somewhere that the sickness of our modern society is uh, like loneliness and isolation. Do you think that basic income? Do you think that's true? Like, uh, and both of you actually. And do you think that basic income could be like a solution to that? You mean like as a decolonial uh, kind of kind of having a decolonization impact? Is that sort of what you mean? No, no, no. Like that, it was saying that like the, the, the sickness of modern society. 
east to west, so it's loneliness and like that we are, as humans are isolated. So mm. with the impact we have been speaking about, do you think that that would be possible? I think, it can help. I think you know, I mean, I think that a lot of these, you know, a lot of the malaise of post-modernity, if you will, uh, has to do with our forms of social organization, um, which giving people extra money isn't necessarily going to fix those types of problems, right? So sort of the, 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 uh, what are, what are the, what are the, what's the structural logic of living in a capitalist society, an advanced capitalist society, for instance, right? Uh, I think that, that has a lot more to do with questions of social isolation and these types of things than, uh, uh, necessarily income security, but, uh, at, a, at a more limited level, I absolutely do think that the giving people additional income is the kind of thing that can contribute. We, I mean, we've seen this very clearly to improve social relationships. So it's not only the case that people aren't uh, engaging, you know, we've seen a decline in uh, community solidarity because of a lack of income. It's, it's, it's not, the, not the only reason, of course, it's competitive dynamic, hyper-individualism, all these kinds of things that are really sort of embedded in the ideological sort of framework of our society. Uh, but what we've seen is that uh, it certainly can help people to feel as though they're more able to engage in their community if they're willing to do it, if they're interested in doing it. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not the kind of thing that's gonna fix everything, but, uh, but you know, it can, it can, it can take important steps in that direction. I think that basic income is just one way to increase the sense of community because I think that people are dependent on the situation, but sometimes are really selfish. And I think that when they see each other equally, it helps to increase the sense of we are on the same page so we can help each other. I think that it's a cultural perspective of where I live, but sometimes I think that when people are in the same status of financial situation, they're like, oh, I'm more able to help you when you are able to help me. Not in a, I said that people are selfish, selfish but not in a selfish perspective, but in a helpful way. So if I help you today, you could help me eat tomorrow and we could increase our lives. And I don't know, because I lived in a, in an area where we helped each other a lot with car rides and that kind of stuff because it was a place that it was really distant for the rest of the city. And now I've moved to a better place, but earlier when I lived in this place, we helped each other with car rides and my mother, we, when we were able to afford one car, we started to give car rides for everyone in the neighborhood. So I think that when you are able to help people, I think we kind of, I forgot the word, but yes, that, <laughs> I forgot what I'm saying. My vocabulary is no, kind of no, limited, sure. but <laughs> but I think that I, you understand what I'm saying. I think the income, basic income is just one way to increase the sense of community. And I think that it would help people to pursue their dreams and their their the life that they want for themselves and for the others and that i think we can just start the conversation that i i agree i think uh you know i think one thing i'd say just to kind of pick up on that a little bit is that uh i think you're right that that scarcity that economic scarcity economic insecurity uh does contribute to individualism and competition, right? And I think that if people are, I think you're right in the sense that as people, if there's more equality in society, you're likely to have more social harmony, right? There's likely to be less sort of of that uh, uh, hyper-individualistic competition. Now, again, that's sort of seated in the ideological structure of our society, but there are certainly ways of making it better. And I think basic income moves, moves significantly in that direction. Yeah. I, I wanna tell you about some of the benefits of uh, the Ontario pilot, though, before we go, so I want to make sure I get I want to make sure I get some of that out um, because I think it's important. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Ontario Basic Income Pilot's design, and 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 I think some of the takeaways that uh, people from other jurisdictions can 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 look at the Ontario Basic Income Pilot and say, okay, this is what its its strengths were. 
Um, and and, and we, what we found is that relative to some of the other pilots that have been conducted around uh, around the world recently, that, that, that OBIP, at least in terms of our um, self-selected findings, which were which are can no way replicate what the entire uh, Ontario-based Kingcom pilot would have been if it had been carried out to fruition. But but given what we have seen, uh, you know, one of the really important aspects about OBIP was that it had it had relatively generous rates relative to social assistance rates, and I think that's really you know, an important part of the story to tell. Um, they were. I think that I think that the numbers were something like sixty six percent. So so basic income payment rates were essentially uh, about sixty five percent above the normal uh, disability insurance rates in Ontario, and and almost a hundred percent over existing welfare services. So this was especially for people who had previously been receiving uh, just social assistance. This was a major increase in income for a lot of people. And that's what a basic income has to be if it's going to be successful. Uh, you know, you can't just have poverty wage basic income. It needs to be set at such a level that people are uh, that, that, it, that it can be transformative for people. And that it's actual genuine income security. Uh, so you know, look at the, you look at the Alaska dividend or something like that. That model is not going to be sufficient for a basic income for a, for a proper basic income program because it's you know it's a one time a year payment. People can't make long-term plans on the basis of that type of fluctuating uh, dividend. It's a great idea, it's wonderful, but it's not uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that would be, I think, a, a sustainable as a basic income program. The other aspect, another aspect was uh, the Ontario Basic Income Pilot's unconditionality. And this is a fairly common thing with basic income programs, so I won't belabor this point, but the idea that there were no health or work requirements for anyone who received the pilot. And this was a clear thing. Uh, and this was one of the one of the most substantial benefits for people uh, when when we went during interviews. Uh, it also had a, a broad welfare uh, well being design. So one of the issues with some of the other pilots that have been conducted is that they've largely been employment geared to employment programs. A lot of this has to do with research design because there's some politics involved. Uh, but that really wasn't what the Ontario Basic Income Pilot was about. Yes, it studied employment outcomes. Uh, and it was interested in, in employment outcomes. It wanted to see how employment would be affected. And what we found is that it had a positive impact on employment. It made people more employable. But that wasn't the purpose of the pilot. The purpose of the pilot was to see whether or not it could reduce, it could improve upon the, the punitive uh, model of social assistance that the province and most jurisdictions presently have, which are focused on, you know, which, which have surveillance in terms of healthcare needs, surveillance in terms of whether people are looking for jobs, uh, people find them demeaning, uh, you know, they, 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 they are intrusive into their lives, these kinds of things. And people really found that this was a really incredible element about the basic income pilot here, unconditional, uh, people weren't scrutinizing their affairs, they were just able to receive the money and do what they wanted with it. So there's a feeling of independence for many people. So again, I just wanna say that the, the poverty design, the poverty reduction design was a critical element of this pilot and its success. And then the final thing I would say, uh, it had a, in terms of employability, the take back rate, which is the amount that people receive or people have taken uh, back if they decide to work on the basic income pilot in Ontario was set at 50%. So a 50% take back rate is pretty good. That means you can work while receiving your basic income and still get 50% of your wages. So that was also an incentive for people to work. And uh, a lot of people said, yeah, that's great. We, we uh, you know, receiving a basic income and then I could do, you know, 20 hours of work and make more money or do a full-time job uh, up to a certain point at which it was garnished more than 50%, of course. But, um, but that 50% take back rate function as an incentive for people to work as well. So those would be the main uh, the main sort of takeaways, I think, that other people could take from the Ontario Basic Income Pilot. I personally think that a basic income, if it's to be successful, has to be bounded within a robust uh, existing welfare state apparatus because there are still targeted needs that people have to have dealt with. One of the things that you know people have famously said, well, Milton Friedman was an advocate for basic income, and that's true, but he warned that basic income could function as a Trojan horse unless it were 
uh, bounded within an existing welfare state structure. You don't want to pull away existing programs to supplement basic income. You want a basic income on top of an existing welfare state structure. That's my view for it anyways. So, and I think that the, the Ontario Basic Income Pilot largely did that. I think it largely achieved its objectives. It was designed as a poverty reduction program and it it reduced poverty for the people who received it and had, had profound benefits. So uh, what we found is that the pilot, although it was canceled and um, that's obviously uh, will, will always be its legacy, uh, but that there, we were able to find anyways, very significant benefits from the people who received it. So like just for like, for us to be like complete honest and complete open with, with the audience, um, have there been like any negative or like not ideal uh, results in your study and how can we address them it's hard it's 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 really hard to to um to comment on that particular question because the cancellation had such a profound effect that we can't really say what it would have been like if it hadn't been for the cancellation so yes, some people uh, ultimately, once a cancellation happened, it changed people's perspectives. A lot of people, uh, you know, it, it drove some people into negative mental health uh, circumstances. And so um, I think it's fair to say that probably some of the choices people made after the cancellation uh, weren't as, how should we say, productive towards the enhancement of their human capital in some cases as, as it was before. But it, the context of that situation is completely different. We're not really in a basic income situation anymore. Now we're in a six months until, until you lose your, your source of income situation. So to assess that from a methodological standpoint, it's difficult to say. I met one single person who basically told me that, and they were a younger person, and they told me basically, yeah, I was one of the people who just got my basic income and just had fun with it. But that was one person out of hundreds who we consulted. And I can't think of a single other who I could say didn't use their basic income to improve their lives in some way or their life. And that person's life was probably improved too, just not probably in the socially productive ways that, that we were all thinking. There are always going to be people like people who use programs and, uh, uh, you know, in ways that probably don't fulfill the uh, society's objectives, but that's not a good reason for not implementing uh, a social program that can help out uh, all kinds of people. So, and that's what we found. Basically, it's so strong to have fun, also like it's unconditional. So well, that's just it, right? It's it's uh, even even people who have income security deserve to have fun every once in a while. That's my take, anyways. I think that it's a pretty good argument to defend the basic income because we can't judge how people are spending that money. I think it's one of the arguments that if it's working a good way, it could lead people to defend the program because I think sometimes people just judge the other without thinking that they have long-term plans just like them, I think. Sometimes we say, oh, I would use that money to my education, but I think that him will not. And I think that's a pretty, I don't know, wrong idea because I think basic income is, is that, just free money and you use the way you think it's good for you. And we should just defend it to be implemented. And what people would do with that money, it's not like on our hands, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, there, there's, of course, a libertarian argument for basic income. And that's largely the argument that, that they, they want to make is that, look, this is this enhances people's freedom in society. Right. You're, you're, you're free to do. You're not restricted by an external social relationship that requires you to sell your labor, et cetera, et cetera. To be truly free, you basically have to have the capacity to actually make make choices that aren't restricted. And that's what that's what basic income can do. Do you think that the results like, um, of in, in, in Ontario would be like are repetitive in other parts of the world, or like is it for Ontario? Is it it's not only for Ontario? 
Well, no, like, like I say, the, the the Prince Edward Island. Uh, yeah, I think I think that I think that the momentum created by basic income has led to a national conversation on basic income. Mm -hmm. So a report was just it wasn't a particularly positive report, but there were political reasons as to why. I mean, the panel was not necessarily people who would be basic income advocates. Uh, there was a, there was a, a report released, like a 400 page report released in British Columbia on basic income commissioned by the province. Uh, and like I say, it didn't necessarily have great things to say about basic income, but the idea is that at least the province commissioned a study. In Prince Edward Island, they are presently engaging in a fairly robust process to, you know, a long, years long process to consider a basic income. Whether it will happen, I don't know. But again, the conversation is happening. Like I say, there's a conversation happening at, in the Senate right now uh, about literally right now, the bill is uh, being being discussed on the on the Senate floor. So this is uh, this this is becoming part of the mainstream policy discussion in Canada. Uh, and and we'll have to see what happens over the next few years. It would not surprise me to see uh, a government either either run on uh, or, a, or a political party, either run on a platform for basic income or uh, attempt another pilot. Whether we'll move towards actually implementing a basic income, because that's where we need to go now around the world. We've had a lot of tests. Virtually every test demonstrates the same thing. It, it's very effective, has integral benefits. It's time to now move towards the process of, of constructing the architecture for a basic income. I think that's that's where we are in, in late 2023. Uh, I think Ahmed asked about the, uh, 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 sorry, like to implement your projects in another areas. And do you think that it's more effective to just trying to start in the whole country or in small communities and then increasing to a level that would attend to everyone? Very good question. Um, not in one that I haven't given a lot of thought to, to be honest. Um, I think I think that basic income could be very effective on a on a small scale uh, basis, especially uh, especially in, in small communities. So I think it wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea to to start a project, uh, you know, especially in the initial stages of development in a smaller place, and then to expand it. But really, if it's to be effective, a basic income has to be a, a, a you know a national program or a program that's at least at the very least regional in some kind of way uh, that involves more than just one or another community. Um, you know, for, for the same reason that you wouldn't want uh, different standards of healthcare in one community and another community. Uh, you know, so eventually this is going to have to be universalized, and I think it ultimately will be. Um, but, but. I think in terms of if we're being realistic politically, it probably makes more, it, it may make more sense in some cases to start in a small scale place, demonstrate its effectiveness and try to move it out from there. But the question is, do you have the political time to carry that out? So to be honest, I'd love to keep you with us for another hour, but uh, <laughs> you told me that you have a meeting soon? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta run. I said something for around 1230. So I should probably, I should probably get going pretty soon if I can. But uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. This is great. Let's do it again if you want. If you want to do something sure. again in a couple of months. Sure, anytime. Uh, about income. Whenever you have time. Yeah. Just send me a mail. Okay. I will have you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's that easy. It's that easy. Let's close it before you tell us like your closing words for the audience. Let's close it just an off topic question. Anna was just telling me before you zoomed in that she was yesterday in a concert. Uh, and because of that, I'd like to ask both of you, which could like, for that positive feeling and like, you know, for that warmth, which concert that is also connected with basic income, which concert or which band, which music would you recommend people to listen to? Both of you. You know, I'm, I'm I'm getting into classical music right now. I I, I, uh, I you know I've been listening to a lot of Mozart, uh, a lot of Mazgorsky, and I don't know if I've said his name right, but um, but but you know, more traditionally, uh, I've I'm kind of a classic rock fan. So if if I could ever, it'll never happen. But if if Led Zeppelin were ever to do another uh, were ever to do another tour, uh, I'd have to buy a ticket.
probably go. So that would be my answer. But they're 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 almost in their eighties now, so I don't think uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's likely. But yes, Led Zeppelin. I think they're uh, uh, they they would be the band that I would want to see. Actually, I have a pretty bad joke to make because we were talking about music, and I think what music connects with basic income, and I was the whole interview thinking about the musical Hamilton. Because every time you said Hamilton, I'm like Hamilton, Hamilton, and Lee Manuel Miranda come to my head at all the interviews. So sometimes I was like, I'm not throwing away my shot. And you were talking, I'm like, I'm not throwing away my shot. And I think it's a music that really connects with basic income because in the music, Hamilton talks about how he's a dreamer and he wants the best for his country. So I think it, it's a music that connects to basic income. So like, how can I comment about Hamilton on that, in that interview? And I think that's it. I think that's the, my, my comment about music. Hamilton well, and answer. basic income. The first Hamilton music. Was dealing with a, with like us dealing with a period of, of, of profound political change. Great, great, great answer. Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> To be honest, as someone as like who studied economics, I, when I hear Hamilton, like when I hear the songs of Hamilton, I'm thinking about how that, I'm, I'm, a man who just like I'm thinking about the death plan he tried to implement. Oh, that's funny. We've all got different conceptions of Hamilton in our head. <laughs> I'm thinking about the economist, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's good. Well, thank you so much, eh? I re I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate this. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so very much. Thank Have a nice day. Okay, you too. Take care. Maybe we'll see you again. 100%. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.